Chapter Twenty One Laurie Makes Mischief and Joe Makes Peace. Joe's face was a study next day, for the secret rather weighed upon her, and she found it hard not to look mysterious and important. Meg observed it, but did not trouble herself to make inquiries, for she had learned that the best way to manage Joe was by the law of contraries, so she felt sure of being told everything if she did not ask. She was rather surprised, therefore, when the silence remained unbroken, and Joe assumed a patronizing air, which decidedly aggravated Meg, who in turn assumed an air of dignified reserve and devoted herself to her mother. This left Joe to her own devices for Mrs. March had taken her place as nurse, and bade her rest, exercise, and amuse herself after her long confinement. Amy being gone, Laurie was her only refuge, and much as she enjoyed his society, she rather dreaded him just then, for he was an incorrigible tease, and she feared he would coax the secret from her. She was quite right, for the mischief-loving lad no sooner suspected a mystery than he set himself to find it out, and led Joe a trying life of it. He wheedled, bribed, ridiculed, threatened, and scolded, affected indifference that he might surprise the truth from her, declared he knew, then, that he didn't care, and at last, by dint of perseverance, he satisfied himself that it concerned Meg and Mr. Brooke. Feeling indignant that he was not taken into his tutor's confidence, he set his wits to work to devise some proper retaliation for the slight. Meg, meanwhile, had apparently forgotten the matter, and was absorbed in preparations for her father's return. But all of a sudden a change seemed to come over her, and for a day or two she was quite unlike herself. She started when spoken to, blushed when looked at, was very quiet, and sat over her sewing with a timid, troubled look on her face. To her mother's inquiry she answered that she was quite well, and Joe's she silenced by begging to be let alone. She feels it in the air. Love, I mean, and he's going very fast. She's got most of the symptoms, is twittery and cross, doesn't eat, lies awake and mopes in corners. I caught her singing that song he gave her, and once she said John, as you do, and then turned red as a poppy. Whatever shall we do?" said Joe, looking ready for any measures, however violent. Nothing but wait. Let her alone, be kind and patient and father's coming will settle everything," replied her mother. "'Here's a note to you, Meg, all sealed up. How odd! Teddy never seals mine,' said Jo next day, as she distributed the contents of the little post-office. Mrs. March and Jo were deep in their own affairs, when a sound from Meg made them look up to see her staring at her note with a frightened face. "'My child, what is it?' cried her mother running to her while Joe tried to take the paper which had done the mischief. "'It's all a mistake! He didn't send it! Oh, Joe, how could you do it?' And Meg hid her face in her hands, crying as if her heart were quite broken. "'Me? I've done nothing! What's she talking about?' cried Joe, bewildered. Meg's mild eyes kindled with anger as she pulled a crumpled note from her pocket and threw it at Joe, saying reproachfully, you wrote it, and that bad boy helped you. How could you be so rude, so mean and cruel to us both?" Joe hardly heard her, for she and her mother were reading the note, which was written in a peculiar hand. "'My dearest Margaret, I can no longer restrain my passion, and must know my fate before I return. I dare not tell your parents yet, but I think they would consent if they knew that we adored one another. Mr. Lawrence will help me to some good place, and then, my sweet girl, you will make me happy. I implore you to say nothing to your family yet, but to send one word of hope through Laurie to your devoted John. Oh, the little villain! That's the way he meant to pay me for keeping my word to mother. I'll give him a hearty scolding and bring him over to beg pardon," cried Joe, burning to execute immediate justice. But her mother held her back saying with a look she seldom wore. "'Stop, Joe. You must clear yourself first. You have played so many pranks that I am afraid you have had a hand in this.' "'On my word, mother, I haven't. I never saw that note before, and don't know anything about it as true as I live,' said Joe, so earnestly that they believed her. "'If I had taken part in it I'd have done it better than this, and have written a sensible note. I should think you'd have known Mr. Brooke wouldn't write such stuff as that.' she said, scornfully tossing down the paper. 
It's like his writing, faltered Meg, comparing it with the note in her hand. Oh, Meg, you didn't answer it, cried Mrs. March quickly. Yes, I did. And Meg hid her face again, overcome with shame. Here's a scrape. Do let me bring that wicked boy over to explain and be lectured. I can't rest till I get hold of him. And Joe made for the door again. Hush! Let me handle this, for it is worse than I thought. Margaret, tell me the whole story," commanded Mrs. March, sitting down by Meg, yet keeping hold of Joe, lest she should fly off. "'I received the first letter from Lorry, who didn't look as if he knew anything about it,' began Meg, without looking up. "'I was worried at first and meant to tell you. Then I remembered how you liked Mr. Brooke, so I thought you wouldn't mind if I kept my little secret for a few days. I'm so silly that I like to think no one knew. And while I was deciding what to say, I felt like the girls in books who have such things to do. Forgive me, mother. I'm paid for my silliness now. I never can look him in the face again." "'What did you say to him?' asked Mrs. March. "'I only said I was too young to do anything about it yet, that I didn't wish to have secrets from you and he must speak to father. I was very grateful for his kindness and would be his friend, but nothing more, for a long while." Mrs. March smiled as if well pleased, and Jo clapped her hands exclaiming with a laugh, "'You are almost equal to Caroline Percy, who is a pattern of prudence. Tell on, Meg, what did he say to that?' "'He writes in a very different way entirely, telling me that he never sent any love letter at all, and is very sorry that my roguish sister Jo should take liberties with our names. It's very kind and respectful, but think how dreadful for me!' Meg leaned against her mother, looking the image of despair and Jo tramped about the room, calling Lori names. All of a sudden she stopped, caught up the two notes, and after looking at them closely, said decidedly, "'I don't believe Brooke ever saw either of these letters. Teddy wrote both, and keeps yours to crow over me with because I wouldn't tell him my secret.' "'Don't have any secrets, Jo. Tell it to Mother and keep out of trouble, as I should have done,' said Meg warningly. Bless you, child, mother told me. That will do, Joe. I'll comfort Meg while you go and get Laurie. I shall sift the matter to the bottom, and put a stop to such pranks at once." Away ran Joe, and Mrs. March gently told Meg Mr. Brooke's real feelings. "'Now, dear, what are your own? Do you love him enough to wait till he can make a home for you, or will you keep yourself quite free for the present?' "'I've been so scared and worried. I don't want to have anything to do with lovers for a long while, perhaps never," answered Meg petulantly. "'If John doesn't know anything about this nonsense, don't tell him, and make Joe and Laurie hold their tongues. I won't be deceived and plagued and made a fool of. It's a shame." Seeing Meg's usually gentle temper was roused and her pride hurt by this mischievous joke, Mrs. March soothed her by promises of entire silence and great discretion for the future. The instant Laurie's step was heard in the hall, Meg fled into the study, and Mrs. March received the culprit alone. Jo had not told him why he was wanted, fearing he wouldn't come, but he knew the minute he saw Mrs. March's face, and stood twirling his hat with a guilty air, which convicted him at once. Jo was dismissed, but chose to march up and down the hall like a sentinel, having some fear that the prisoner might bolt. The sound of voices in the parlour rose and fell for half an hour, but what happened during that interview the girls never knew. When they were called in, Laurie was standing by their mother with such a penitent face that Joe forgave him on the spot, but did not think it wise to betray the fact. Meg received his humble apology, and was much comforted by the assurance that Brooke knew nothing of the joke. "'I'll never tell him till my dying day. Wild horses shan't drag it out of me so you'll forgive me, Meg.' and I'll do anything to show how out-and-out out sorry I am," he added, looking very much ashamed of himself. "'I'll try. But it was a very ungentlemanly thing to do. I didn't think you could be so sly and malicious, Laurie," replied Meg, trying to hide her maidenly confusion under a gravely reproachful air. "'It was altogether abominable, and I don't deserve to be spoken to for a month. But you will, though, won't you?' and Laurie folded his hands together with such an imploring gesture, as he spoke in his irresistibly persuasive tone, that it was impossible to frown upon him, in spite of his scandalous behaviour. Meg pardoned him, and Mrs. March's grave face relaxed, 
in spite of her efforts to keep sober, when she heard him declare that he would atone for his sins by all sorts of penances, and abase himself like a worm before the injured damsel. Jo stood aloof, meanwhile trying to harden her heart against him, and succeeding only in priming up her face into an expression of entire disapprobation. Lorry looked at her once or twice, but as she showed no sign of relenting, he felt injured, and turned his back on her till the others were done with him, when he made her a low bow and walked off without a word. As soon as he had gone she wished she had been more forgiving, and when Meg and her mother went upstairs she felt lonely and longed for Teddy. After resisting for some time she yielded to the impulse, and armed with a book to return, went over to the big house. "'Is Mr. Lawrence in?' asked Jo of a housemaid, who was coming downstairs. "'Yes, miss. But I don't believe he's seeable just yet.' "'Why not? Is he ill?' "'La, no, miss. But he's had a scene with Mr. Lorry, who is in one of his tantrums about something which vexes the old gentleman, so I doesn't go nigh him.' "'Where is Lorry? "'Shut up in his room. And he won't answer, though I've been a tapping. I don't know what's to become of the dinner, for it's ready and there's no one to eat it. I'll go up and see what the matter is. I'm not afraid of either of them." Up went Joe, and knocked smartly on the door of Lorry's little study. "'Stop that, or I'll open the door and make you!' called out the young gentleman in a threatening tone. Joe immediately knocked again. The door flew open, and in she bounced before Lorry could recover from his surprise. Seeing that he really was out of temper, Joe, who knew how to manage him, assumed a contrite expression, and going artistically down upon her knees, said meekly, "'Please forgive me for being so cross. I came to make it up, and can't go away till I have.' Oh, "'It's all right. Get up, and don't be a goose, Joe. was the cavalier reply to her petition. "'Thank you, I will. Could I ask what's the matter? You don't look exactly easy in your mind.' "'I've been shaken, and I won't bear it.' growled Lorry indignantly. "'Who did it?' demanded Joe. "'Grandfather! If it had been any one else, I'd have—' And the injured youth finished his sentence by an energetic gesture of the right arm. "'That's nothing. I often shake you, and you don't mind,' said Joe soothingly. "'Pooh, you're a girl, and it's fun. But I'll allow no man to shake me.' I don't think anyone would care to try it if you looked as much like a thundercloud as you do now. Why were you treated so? Just because I wouldn't say what your mother wanted me for. I'd promised not to tell, and of course I wasn't going to break my word. Couldn't you satisfy your grandpa in any other way? No, he would have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'd have told my part of the scrape if I could without bringing Meg in. As I couldn't, I held my tongue and bore the scolding till the old gentleman collared me. Then I bolted for fear I should forget myself. It wasn't nice, but he's sorry, I know, so go down and make up. I'll help you. Hanged if I do. I'm not going to be lectured and pummeled by everyone just for a bit of a frolic. I was sorry about Meg and begged pardon like a man, but I won't do it again when I wasn't in the wrong. He didn't know that. He ought to trust me and not act as if I was a baby. It's no use, Joe. He's got to learn that I'm able to take care of myself and don't need anyone's apron string to hold on by." "'What pepper-pots you are!' sighed Joe. "'How do you mean to settle this affair?' "'Well, he ought to beg pardon, and believe me when I say I can't tell him what the fuss is about.' "'Bless you! He won't do that.' "'I won't go down till he does.' "'Now, Teddy, be sensible. Let it pass, and I'll explain what I can. You can't stay here, so what's the use of being melodramatic? I don't intend to stay here long anyway. I'll slip off and take a journey somewhere, and when Grandpa misses me he'll come round fast enough. I dare say, but you ought not to go and worry him. Don't preach. I'll go to Washington and see Brooke. It's gay there, and I'll enjoy myself after the troubles. Ah, oh, what fun you'd have. I wish I could run off too," said Joe forgetting her part of mentor in lively visions of martial life at the capital. Oh, come on, then. Why not? You go and surprise your father, and I'll stir up old Brooke. It would be a glorious joke. Let's do it, Joe. We'll leave a letter saying we are all right and trot off at once. I've got money enough. It will do you good, and no harm, as you go to your father. For a moment Joe looked as if she would agree, 
for wild as the plan was, it just suited her. She was tired of care and confinement, longed for change, and thoughts of her father blended temptingly with the novel charms of camps and hospitals, liberty and fun. Her eyes kindled as they turned wistfully toward the window, but they fell on the old house opposite, and she shook her head with sorrowful decision. If I was a boy we'd run away together and have a capital time, but as I'm a miserable girl I must be proper and stop at home. Don't tempt me, Teddy. It's a crazy plan." "'That's the fun of it!' began Laurie, who had got a willful fit on him and was possessed to break out of bounds in some way. "'Hold your tongue!' cried Joe, covering her ears. "'Prunes and prisms are my doom, and I may as well make up my mind to it. I came here to moralize, not to hear things that make me skip to think of." "'I know Meg would wet blanket such a proposal, but I thought you had more spirit,' began Laurie insinuatingly. "'Bad boy, be quiet. Sit down and think of your own sins. Don't go making me add to mine. If I get your grandpa to apologize for the shaking, will you give up running away?' asked Joe seriously. "'Yes, but you won't do it,' answered Laurie, who wished to make up, but felt that his outraged dignity must be appeased first. "'If I can manage the young one, I can the old one,' muttered Joe as she walked away, leaving Laurie bent over a railroad map with his head propped up on both hands. "'Come in.' And Mr. Lawrence's gruff voice sounded gruffer than ever, as Joe tapped at his door. "'It's only me, sir, come to return a book,' she said blandly as she entered. "'Want any more?' asked the old gentleman, looking grim and vexed, but trying not to show it. "'Yes, please. I like old Sam so well I think I'll try the second volume,' returned Joe, hoping to propitiate him by accepting a second dose of Boswell's Johnson, as he had recommended that lively work. The shaggy eyebrows unbent a little as he rolled the steps toward the shelf where the Johnsonian literature was placed. Joe skipped up, and sitting on the top step, affected to be searching for her book, but was really wondering how best to introduce the dangerous object of her visit. Mr. Lawrence seemed to suspect that something was brewing in her mind, for after taking several brisk turns about the room, he faced round on her, speaking so abruptly that Rasselas tumbled face downward on the floor. "'What has that boy been about? Don't try to shield him. I know he has been in mischief by the way he acted when he came home. I can't get a word from him, and when I threatened to shake the truth out of him, he bolted upstairs and locked himself into his room. He did wrong, but we forgave him, and all promised not to say a word to any one," began Joe reluctantly. That won't do. He shall not shelter himself behind a promise from you soft-hearted girls. If he's done anything amiss, he shall confess, beg pardon, and be punished. Out with it, Joe. I won't be kept in the dark. Mr. Lawrence looked so alarming and spoke so sharply that Joe would have gladly run away if she could, but she was perched aloft on the steps, and he stood at the foot, a lion in the path, so she had to stay and brave it out. "'Indeed, sir, I cannot tell. Mother forbade it. Laurie has confessed, asked pardon, and been punished quite enough. We don't keep silence to shield him, but someone else, and it will make more trouble if you interfere. Please don't. It was partly my fault, but it's all right now. So let's forget it and talk about the Rambler or something pleasant." "'Hang the Rambler! Come down and give me your word that this harum-scarum boy of mine hasn't done anything ungrateful or impertinent. If he has, after all your kindness to him, I'll thrash him with my own hands." The threat sounded awful, but did not alarm Joe, for she knew the irascible old gentleman would never lift a finger against his grandson, whatever he might say to the contrary. She obediently descended, and made as light of the prank as she could without betraying Meg or forgetting the truth. Hmm. Ah, well, if the boy held his tongue because he promised, and not from obstinacy, I'll forgive him. He's a stubborn fellow, and hard to manage," said Mr. Lawrence, rubbing up his hair till it looked as if he had been out in a gale, and smoothing the frown from his brow with an air of relief. So am I but a kind word will govern me when all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't," said Joe, trying to say a kind word for her friend, who seemed to get out of one scrape only to fall into another. "'You think I'm not kind to him, eh?' 
was the sharp answer. "'Oh, dear, no, sir. You are rather too kind sometimes, and then just a trifle hasty when he tries your patience. Don't you think you are?' Joe was determined to have it out now, and tried to look quite placid, though she quaked a little after her bold speech. To her great relief and surprise the old gentleman only threw his spectacles on to the table with a rattle, and exclaimed frankly, "'You're right, girl. I am. I love the boy. But he tries my patience past bearing, and I know how it will end, if we go on so. I'll tell you. He'll run away." Jo was sorry for that speech the minute it was made. She meant to warn him that Lorry would not bear much restraint, and hoped he would be more forbearing with the lad. Mr. Lawrence's ruddy face changed suddenly, and he sat down with a troubled glance at the picture of a handsome man which hung over his table. It was Lorry's father who had run away in his youth and married against the imperious old man's will. Jo fancied he remembered and regretted the past, and she wished she had held her tongue. "'He won't do it unless he is very much worried, and only threatens it sometimes when he gets tired of studying. I often think I should like to, especially since my hair was cut. So if you ever miss us you may advertise for two boys and look among the ships bound for India.' She laughed as she spoke, and Mr. Lawrence looked relieved evidently taking the whole as a joke. "'You hussy! How dare you talk in that way! Where is your respect for me, and your proper bringing up? Bless the boys and girls! What torments they are! Yet we can't do without them!' he said, pinching her cheeks good-humouredly. "'Go and bring that boy down to his dinner. Tell him it's all right, and advise him not to put on tragedy airs with his grandfather. I won't bear it.' "'He won't come, sir. He feels badly because you didn't believe him when he said he couldn't tell. I think the shaking hurt his feelings very much." Jo tried to look pathetic, but must have failed, for Mr. Lawrence began to laugh, and she knew the day was won. "'I'm sorry for that, and ought to thank him for not shaking me, I suppose. What the dickens does the fellow expect?' And the old gentleman looked a trifle ashamed of his own testiness. "'If I were you I'd write him an apology, sir. He says he won't come down till he has one, and talks about Washington, and goes on in an absurd way. A formal apology will make him see how foolish he is, and bring him down quite amiable. Try it. He likes fun, and this way is better than talking. I'll carry it up and teach him his duty." Mr. Lawrence gave her a sharp look, and put on his spectacles, saying slowly, "'You're a sly puss, but I don't mind being managed by you and Beth. Here." Give me a bit of paper, and let's have done with this nonsense." The note was written in the terms which one gentleman would use to another after offering some deep insult. Jo dropped a kiss on the top of Mr. Lawrence's bald head, and ran up to slip the apology under Lorry's door, advising him through the keyhole to be submissive, decorous, and a few other agreeable impossibilities. Finding the door locked again, she left the note to do its work, and was going quietly away when the young gentleman slid down the banisters and waited for her at the bottom, saying with his most virtuous expression of countenance, "'What a good fellow you are, Joe! Did you get blown up?' he added, laughing. "'No, he was pretty mild on the whole.' "'Ah, I got it all round. Even you cast me off over there, and I felt just ready to go to the deuce,' he began apologetically. "'Don't talk that way. Turn over a new leaf and begin again, Teddy, my son." I keep turning over new leaves and spoiling them as I used to spoil my copy-books. And I make so many beginnings there never will be an end," he said dolefully. Go and eat your dinner. You'll feel better after it. Men always croak when they are hungry. And Joe whisked out the front door after that. That's a label on my sect answered Lorry, quoting Amy as he went to partake of humble pie dutifully with his grandfather, who was quite saintly in temper, and overwhelmingly respectful in manner all the rest of the day. Everyone thought the matter ended and the little cloud blown over, but the mischief was done, for though others forgot it, Meg remembered. She never alluded to a certain person, but she thought of him a good deal, dreamed dreams more than ever, and once Jo, rummaging her sister's desk for stamps, found a bit of paper scribbled over with the words, Mrs. John Brooke, whereat she groaned tragically and cast it into the fire, 
feeling that Laurie's prank had hastened the evil day for her. 